Uh, we have a really interesting uh, broad perspective on some very important data initiatives that are going on both in the U.S. and uh, internationally. And uh, we're going to take the speakers in the order that they are shown to you on the, uh, on the schedule. So our first uh, speaker will be uh, Peter Axelrod from the DTCC, and he's going to talk to us about clearing houses. And you're going to sit? You're going to stand. I'll, I'll, you know what, I'll stand. Okay. Um, actually, given the uh, discussion this morning, a lot of which was very interesting, I'm going to ignore most of the slides. Uh, this one and the next one are the only one I will uh, really talk about. Um, what, I, what I wanted to note is that this most recent crisis sort of illustrated again how important it is for regulators and other authorities to have at their fingertips up to the minute data about the markets that might be affected either by the crisis or particularly by any action they might take to try to address the crisis. Um, as, as one example here, uh, when the EU authorities were considering what to do uh, to address the sovereign debt crisis, they were very much concerned about ripple effects into the CDS market. They were concerned about uh, triggering credit events, so forth and so on. Um, and fortunately, you know, the data not only was public, I pulled this off our website from the right time frame, uh, that was public in aggregate, but the authorities themselves actually had very granular data. They knew, they knew exactly who had what positions, what the trading was, so forth and so on. And the important thing here is there's a big difference between gross exposure in the CDS market and net exposure. Uh, the, the way to think about it is um, net notional, which is the column, the first column of numbers there on the left, is Think of it as if you take all the net sellers of protection and add up how much protection they've sold, that's the net, that is the net notional. And what that means is if there is a credit event on that underlying and there is zero recovery, that's the amount of dollars that's going to change hands. It's not the gross number. How do I know this? Because we operate the settlement for that and we actually net everything down and, and it's, settled on a net, it's settled on a net basis. Now, if somebody fails and the nets have to be partially undone, that's a complication. But really, the exposures are that. And if you look at this list, right, Greece isn't even on the top 15, right? In fact, the net exposure to Greece, which is also public, it's just not on the top 15, is about $4 billion at that time. Um, you know, and the other thing I would point out is these numbers are actually very small particularly relative to uh, the size of the bonds outstanding. So why worry about credit events? With Greece, maybe if there's four billion outstanding, it would be good to trigger a credit event just to clean everything up and start over again. Um, I, I saw Kevin Gould walk in. That might create a problem for the people having to run the auction, but uh, that, was, that was a suggestion. So uh, this data is available. The CDS markets, I think, are very unusual in that, as far as I can tell, they are the only market where this type of data on a global basis is available to regulators directly online. There are about between 30 and 40 regulators around the world that actually have direct online access to this database. Uh, we've been given guidance by the OTC Derivatives Regulators Forum as to how this data should be apportioned out. That guidance was signed by all 44 members of the forum and, and fully and formally endorsed by each of them, and we set up the entitlements accordingly. Is it absolutely perfect? No. Are there things to work on? Sure. But basically, the data is uh, the data's there. Um, and I, I wanted to point out two things about the data. There's a public aspect and a private aspect to it. If we go back to this slide, if I'm, this is, this is public data because it shows aggregates. If there's a lot of speculation 
that, you know, the CDS exposure to Greece is, you know, five, six, seven hundred billion dollars. And sometimes speculation gets that wild. What do you think the market reaction is going to be? Probably not what you'd like it to be. So it's important that this number doesn't overstate the exposure. Right? Overstating exposure causes bad things to happen in, happen in markets that are sort of unjustified. Why am I focusing so much on overstating exposure? The reason is that if the data globally, right, Greece is traded all around the world, uh, banks, you know, it's traded primarily offshore. Uh, you can't look at any particular regional data set to find out what the exposure to Greece actually is. You've got to look at the global data set. But if it's not all aggregated, the net exposure almost for sure will be overstated because if, it, if you're getting information from several places, you're not going to have the positions are likely not going to be fully netted. And if you, if you add up all of the disparate data sets, you're going to get a number that's larger than the number that you get from the, uh, in the global data set. We did this uh, a while ago just to ask ourselves, what if you reported clear data and bilateral data separately? In some cases, it would double the apparent exposure. So bad thing to overstate exposure. The other thing that happens with fragmented data is that the regulators begin to lose confidence in the data they have. And we, we saw that recently where even though this is very, very good data because it actually, we actually use it to move money and so forth and so on and banks are, uh, banks are motivated to keep the data good for that reason, people began to question it because there was just so much noise in the marketplace about the numbers are too small, so forth and so on, they just began to question the data. Um, again, if the data were fragmented along, you know, national lines, regional lines, uh, whatever, you can see a situation where Deutsche Bank does a trade with JP Morgan on Greece well, Deutsche Bank has a reporting responsibility in Europe. JP Morgan has a re reporting responsibility in the, in the US. And lo and behold, one trade has become two. You have an inventory control problem. Uh, the only efficient, because the trade's reported in two places, and you don't know whether it's the same trade or not. Um, the only efficient way that we've been able to under come up with to deal with that is, again, to have a global database. So what does that mean going forward? Um, as everybody knows, uh, one of the requirements of the Dodd-Frank Act and one of the pending requirements of EMIR and one of the G20 commitments is that all, all swaps be reported to trade repositories. Not only is Dodd-Frank doing that, EMIR is clearly going to do it. Um, and every other G20 country is going to do it. They all have plans. They're all requiring reporting. So not only does this create problems of inventory control, but it creates problems for multi-jurisdictional firms. And I guess what I want to talk about in the next five minutes is how these multi -juris the problems it creates for these firms and how these firms have tried to resolve them, because the way these firms are resolving this, I think, would serve as a basis for providing good, accurate data for asset classes other than OTC derivatives, as, it, as people uh, will inevitably request data around those as well. We are, typically, the industry had, oh, I'd say, maybe six months ago, come to the realization that if, if compliance with reporting requirements was not an industry project, where everybody agreed on a particular way of doing it and did it that way, it would never get done. And the first problem everybody had was I, you know, for multi-jurisdictional financial institutions, which is almost all of the major players in these markets, whether buy side, sell side, nobody limits themselves to one jurisdiction. Um, if I play in 16 different markets and have 16 different reporting obligations, even if they are identical, how am I going to manage this? How am I going to know which goes where? How am I going to reconcile this? How am I going to make sure that I'm meeting my compliance requirements fully? 
And the reason this got everybody's attention is, and this is one of the things I think Dodd-Frank did right, Dodd-Frank says, the parties to the trades shall report. That's what it says. If they get it wrong, if it's inaccurate, it is likely that the first call, oh, there are people in the room who know better than I, is not going to go to the compliance officer that messed it up. It's likely going to go to the CEO, and that will be the compliance officer's introduction to the CEO. Some regulator called me up and said, you messed this up. Most compliance officers really don't want to have that be their introduction to the CEO. So they're very concerned about getting this right. And really, they've all sort of come up with the same solution, which is the only way I can get it right is to take everything that might have to be reported anywhere, put it to a single source, set up a daily, if not hourly, weekly, real-time reconciliation process with that, with that reported information, and have that source sort of figure out what goes where. Because that way you can be sure that you're not double counting, uh, that your in inventory control is correct, and that reconciliation is happening as it's supposed to. And I, again, you know, it's a little bit arcane, but I don't want to understate the difficulty of having that happen. Data reporting in the past, regulatory data reporting in the past has been, you know, MIFID is requiring us to report some data, so we'll go into one of our systems and report some data. Not much thoughts given as to whether it's right or not. Uh, it, I'm not really talking out of school. There's been a lot of cases where it's been wrong. Here, the firms, who, the reporting firms, are basically saying, okay, this is real, we have to get it right, we have to establish internal processes that assure that the data that's reported is correct, up to date, we're correcting mistakes, everybody has all the data that they need. Um, that is a massive, massive internal reconciliation process that has to be set up. It's likely the banks are only going to do this once. And I must say, I'm somewhat despairing of the international regulatory community uh, because I think, as the senator mentioned this morning, politics interferes with good regulation. I, I think the political environment may not let the regulators get together and make sure this is done correctly. Let's put it that way. I, I know that the regulators are trying very hard to to, to have this done correctly and to have consolid good consolidated aggregate data. I don't know whether the political environment is going to be uh, conducive to that uh, around the world. Um, so with that, I, I guess I would only add in closing that national efforts um, such as uh, you know, the, uh, the big database in the sky that we're going to have for the OFR or national efforts that any other jurisdiction is going to have uh, to do essentially the same things to, to get a lot of data. Those efforts, because the jurisdictional reach of the national efforts are, are, are somewhat limited, you can't capture offshore derivative trading at all um, because you don't have the jurisdictional reach. Those national efforts, I think, are going to fall short. And if those national efforts sort of all go their own way and don't sort of lever common sort of global data sets, I think you're going to end up with a lot of information missing. And a good example is the Greece crisis, right? If Greece had a national effort to get everybody to report trading on Greek debt or, or trading on Greek CDS, their jurisdictional reach only, only goes to Greek banks. If the EU did this, their jurisdictional reach only went to EU counterparties. Two US counterparties trade in Greek underlyings, that's beyond the EU jurisdictional reach. These problems are real. I think uh, they show a problem, a fundamental problem with national regulators trying to get global data that is relevant to their economic health. And I think 
really the only way to do it is to have, it sounds a little bit kumbaya, but to have all the regulators in the major jurisdictions get together and agree on a single database, a single source from which they will get their data, and they all are going to make sure that that works and that everybody puts the data in that they're supposed to put in. Anyway, I'll leave it there and pass it on to, every, to the other folks. Thank you, Pete. Um, our next speaker has been perfectly set up by Pete and talking about international data efforts. Um, he's at the IMF. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me to, to speak at this. Um, I, I want to do two things. One is to step back a little bit on, and ask the question, what kind of data do we want to collect from a systemic risk perspective? Uh, because, of course, there's so many data that you could collect, you better ask yourself, what are we collecting it for? And then talk more about the international uh, dimension. So, one, what is systemic risk? That's the topic of the conference, uh, uh, so it also be, should be the topic of the data collection. I define this way, risk that financial markets become impaired in their ability to intermediate and facilitate uh, uh, risk transfers. The other definitions, but the point I think everybody understands well what, what we're trying to be after. We also want to differentiate this from the kind of microprudential supervision that we do or the market conduct regulation or integrity for which we collect a lot of data anyhow. Um, and my presumption, and I, I think it's actually the wrong presumption, but nevertheless let's make this presumption, that whatever systemic regulator authority there exists, there also has access to these microprudential data. Um, so on a snapshot it can get all the bank supervisory data, it can get all the market data that the individual regulators, microprudential regulators have. It's actually in practice probably not the case, but nevertheless, we, in some sense, we should work towards that, that goal. Nevertheless, if you were to say, what is systemic risk? What kind of data should I then collect? Well, I think there are various elements to it, and Peter talked probably more about the last phase when you're in a crisis, which we are clearly in Europe and in Greece uh, specifically, but there are also, also other uh, uh, phases. Uh, so there's an ex-ante phase, you try to prevent the crisis or predict it uh, in some sense. Uh, you have a situation of financial turmoil when you're trying to prevent things from going out of hand, and then you're in the situation in which you actually have a crisis that you're trying to manage, intervene, and possibly clean up. Um, now, what do we kind of would we like to see for the ex ante part if we're trying to predict it? So, so what's the problem that we're trying to get after for which we need data? Um, when you think one is the quality of allocation of resources, <laughs> things go wrong. Uh, we have too much housing finance, or we have too much foreign currency lending in some countries, or we have whatever. It ends up being different every time around. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some indicators that you can use. The speed of asset price increases in the internet was a good indicator. Uh, the asset bubbles in housing, uh, etc. cetera. Um, second, financial system, how is it functioning? Is there too much competition? Maybe things are getting a little bit uh, excessive. From that point of view, the level of spreads, the volatility may be too low relative to the risks that are being uh, seen there. And the vulnerabilities, of course, so, so that we avoid kind of anything that can shock the system from becoming systemic in terms of mismatches, foreign currency, uh, and what have you. Um, now that we knew, uh, people use this kind of framework to look at series. They find these three the credit growth and asset price developments to be very useful predictors. Um, they look at spreads as a, a kind of a mispricing indicator. Um, and they look at the mismatch in, in terms of leverage, where it's foreign currency to debt to uh, reserve ratio or other kind of funding mismatches. Um, the nice thing about this, these are very good in terms of a data collection, a good cost-benefit trade-off, uh, right? These data typically are available even at the aggregate level, uh, and you can use them to kind of predict. The problem is that a very poor time in the crisis. Uh, so exposed, we saw house prices being overvalued. Yes, exposed. Exposed, we know that Greece was not doing the right thing. Again, so the problem is the, the timing of these things are not very good. Second, you need a little bit more of a global coverage, and I'll come back to that uh, towards the end. Um, but also there's some glaring gaps. Um, surprisingly, for example, commercial real estate prices, you, you may have a U.S. focus, they're quite good in the U.S., even at the regional level, states, whatever. Um, but if you go global, we don't have good indicators. Uh, so Case Shiller and on the residential side is something unique to the U.S. You may be lucky to get a land price, not even a house price, for many jurisdictions around the world. And that's, of course, a very uh, limited indicator. 
financial turmoil measures. So once we move into the crisis, almost crisis situation, we're dealing with maybe uh, Ju um, June 2007 to June 2008, when we're in a turmoil situation. We like to get all of these measures. We like to get the gross exposures in the interbank markets, so the intra-market exposures. We also get the, like to get the inter between the shadow banking systems and the banks, the puts that are being provided, uh, the leverage again in the system on the households. In this case, also on the, on the uh, sorry on the household side as well. And the financial markets are the haircuts starting to get a little bit out of line. Uh, do we see margins increasing? Um, again, the list that we we know well. What works or what's, what people found to be very useful are these uh, indicators coming from the banking system. And I think I will come back a lot to the bank. I think that's where a lot of the data effort still has to go. Uh, we've talked about shadow banking more recently, but I, I think often when finally the crux comes in terms of crisis, it's the banking system where the, the, the buck stops, so to speak. I think that's also where the data effort should start. Luckily, that is a better place to start because we ha collect a lot of that data already. Um, we probably need to complement that with margin prices, haircuts, and what have you. And again, they have, they have reasonable cost-benefit uh, analysis, I would say. It's not so hard to collect, but just to be smart about it. You need to combine data. So uh, I mentioned, for example, consolidated with office-based data, meaning you look at a consolidated basis for an international financial organization, a bank, but you also need to look at the individual subsidiaries around the world. And you need to use both because you cannot assume that the consolidated loan gives you the picture that a lot of risk at the subsidiary level. Um, I think you can make other comparison. Brokers collect a lot of data that we're not using, I think, sufficiently for risk management point of view. We could go after them. There's privacy issues or other issues, but nevertheless, there's a lot of data there in credit registries around the world, and we have new efforts like the legal entity uh, identifier uh, on this way. Being smart, like Bob Engel is, of course, with his model is also very useful because you can combine price data with some of these market data. So they have, they have reasonable cost-benefit analysis uh, from a data collection point of view. The crisis and cleanup, um, this is where we are in, in many countries here. We've seen it in the US before with the stress test, with TARP, et cetera. Then we need to go very granular in terms of the balance sheets, the non-performer loan, the capital adequacy, the valuation of some of these things. Uh, these days, we also need to look at, at the sovereign. The list uh, is, is well known. Um, the problem is, it, is it really has to be very real time. Uh, so what Peter was saying, you need to know minute by minute, maybe uh, day by day, or at least on a high frequency, somebody's granular global data in order to be able to tell in a crisis where does the Greek problem surface in terms of other banks around the world or the CDSs or what you have you. And secondly, you need to val validate a lot of that. Uh, I mean, it's just not enough to have data that are accounting data, you need to, the market price data, and they need to be cross-referenced and cross-checked as the stress test showed it. It's a bad cost-benefit analysis, uh, and that's in some sense why we only get to these things too late every time around, because it's just very expensive to collect these things in, in a good way. It's also very hard to anticipate the next price, uh, right? So what do we need to collect? We don't know. Um, so it, it's not so easy, um, and I've given you already a long, long launder list, so you probably say, well, well, what do you then want to collect? Uh, well, I'm, actually, I'm not so sure what we should or should not collect as the most prior, priority ones. Uh, uh, I look back at the literature and try to say, okay, maybe the literature can guide us as to what kind of data we should be collecting. So let's go back to the cause of systemic crisis, and maybe that gives us a conceptual framework for saying, well, if a crisis is caused by X, we better track X, because that will help us prevent it, possibly. Um, we have theories, credit crunches, fire sales, herding, network externalities, when one bank defaults, the other one bank may default, or liquidity, or other kind of runs, flight to quality. Um, so what does it mean for data? Well, there's an, been an MBR initiative, there are many initiatives, but among other, one by the, run by the MBR, of what the academic would say is the most useful to collect. So this is just a subsample of what the academics have suggested so far, but nevertheless, it gives us maybe a reduced form of data collection that can be a guide going forward. One, they say, look at capital and liquidity sensitivities. Don't look at the accounting number of capital adequacy requirement. Look at what a shock might mean in terms of capital buffers for each and individual bank. And ask the bank in some sense itself, what would your value at risk or your capital at risk be if I were to shock the system by X or Y 
or liquidity measures. Um, um, this other whole sin of funding liquidity mismatches index. It gives us a snapshot, but nevertheless, it's a useful one. The Daryl Duffy has this idea, bilateral exposure. Let's start simple, 10 by 10 by 10. 10 institutions that report the 10 largest for the 10 count most important counterparts, the 10 largest asset class exposures, uh, and l ask them both the exposure but also the value at risk coming along with that exposure. 10 by 10 by 10 is not that big a matrix. You can still handle it as a data collection effort. Market discipline, besides what uh, Bob Engelberg presented, there's a lot of things that, that the NYU has been uh, promoting in terms of market transparency. Let's have a common indicator for value at risk that banks report so that you can start to aggregate those things as well. Uh, leverage and collateral terms uh, is another one, haircuts. Uh, by John Jacanopoulos uh, and others, uh, Gary Gordon, that has been proposing that. And lastly, I think not unimportant, market intelligence, which is what supervisors already do, but I think the Office of Financial Research and other ones probably are beefing that up as we speak. Talk to people and see where the next risk sits. There is actually a lot more out there that the market already is sniffing out, but we have to bring that out more forcefully um, in, in a way. Now, all of that data, if you were to collect this, this, this is, is a shorter list than I went through before, maybe that alone will help us get towards the risk, as long as you can make it on the aggregate level. You, in, you collect it at an individual firm level or instrument level, but then you have to say, okay, what if I shock the system now as a whole? Does the capital shock that is affecting Bank X affecting the system as a whole? Well, that's where I need to aggregate and come up with a general equilibrium one. So that maybe the, the model and the academics have some useful suggestions. Regardless, I think all the measures have to be global. Without having data at the global level, as Peter and, and other ones I'm sure will, will say as well, we're not going to get very far because it's either going to be circumvented or the markets simply are global as it is. One striking example which I'll, I'll get into is, is the BIS measures of funding mismatches. Uh, we, we were not tracking that very well before the crisis. During the early stage of the crisis, the BES put in a lot of effort to work with existing data, making a lot of assumptions to get to a measure for funding mismatches among the European banks, which turned out to be very large and very critical, and still today is critical to understand what's going on in global markets. Um, uh, and doing that is important. So if, if you were maybe looking at the net positions, for example, you were to look at the right-hand side of these two charts, and you would say, well, on net, the banking system, so that's either the green line or you look at the monetary authorities, the, the, the orange line, they're more or less in balance. The numbers are not very large. We're talking here about less than a trillion. The NBF, the non-banks, is large, but, but that's what it's supposed to be, right? You're supposed to lend to the non-banking sector as a financial intermediary. However, if you were to look at the gross positions, you would suddenly think, wait, there's something funny going on here. We have six trillion or more outstanding among European banks in terms of US dollar funding. That's not, that's being matched by liabilities, but there is a big risk here. And as it uh, occurred, a lot of the spread increases were because these banks could not roll over the funding in dollar terms. We had to have the swap lines. We have to have all the other things. Now the data until that point didn't capture that. So we need to go global in many ways in order to, to, to do that. Beyond going global, uh, going global is also, however, very complicated. Um, um, it's nice to get all the regulators in one room, but what I've discovered participating in some of these meetings, that's not going to be sufficient, unfortunately, uh, to get them all to reveal their data. Um, they come up with reasons, excuses, whatever. Um, uh, there's privacy concerns, there's confidentiality, there's difference in terms of data definitions. It's complex to get it together. Um, something can be done among supervisors. Yes, you can, through MOUs and what have you, memorandum of understandings, get better agreements. Nevertheless, it's not, not uh, obvious. Um, and I think regardless, the goal should probably be more making data publicly available, suitably aggregated in the first place, so that we allow market discipline to work uh, and not only have to rely on the regulators. Um, I, where to start? I would think the start would be the banking system again, uh, because I think that's where, in the end, many of the, the problems occur. And some of the proposals uh, joined between the IMF and the Financial Stability Board uh, and the Basel uh, groups, and more generally the BIS, looking specifically at that. So there's one proposal on looking at global CIFIs, the global system of important financial institutions, a short list, meaning 30 or so institutions, having their bilateral exposures 
uh, provided in a common form to one platform, uh, and then it can be shared on a confidential basis, and some of it can be made public. Um, um, beyond that, there's a lot of effort on creating better banking data where we combine the consolidated with the office-based data. And as I mentioned before, that is important because although consolidated gets you very good at the firm level in terms of a business decision process, it's unfortunately not the case that the inter-firm market is perfect. Uh, it's not a very frictionless market often. Um, so if you ask the subsidiary in some country, can it freely move capital and liquidity to other subsidiaries in the group, then the question is often no, because there are of capital restrictions and other restrictions, but there's also the risk of ring fencing and even sovereign concerns. So, so as a consequence, you need to know both the f subsidiary, the office-based, as well as the group level data. And the differences can be large. So what we did uh, at the IMF is on the horizontal axis, if you were to take just the cross-border data without controlling for some of these offer intra-office activities and subsidiary activities. Uh, um, and then at the vertical axis is, is the corrected number. Um, and it should be a vertical 45-degree um, line if the two numbers were exactly the same. But you see, for some countries, there is a big difference. Uh, because of all these intra-office things that don't map exactly one-to-one, -one, you can be quite a bit off. Um, so with individual bank data, where we go one by one, country by country, and bank by bank, we combine it with the BS data, and you can make a, a better uh, data set. That helps you, if you look at the right uh, uh, part of the chart, in predicting what happened during the crisis. So on the vertical axis is, is, is that number, but uh, made in the relative terms, of what's at risk in terms of foreign exchange exposure, uh, that's the y-axis. And then we look at what happened post-crisis, and we see it's not a perfect predictor, but it's a, it's a predictor that suggests that those countries that had more foreign exposures measured this way had actually more runoff after the crisis in the post-Lehman uh, uh, period. Um, just to show that these data takes effort, but you can combine things. Um, this is where, where the, the initiatives currently stand. So we have uh, one on, on the global better measures of prudential risk that combines leverage data and matures and mismatches across banking systems as well as non-banking systems. Uh, then we have this global template for, for systemic institutions, financial institutions, report on the bilateral basis all of those data on organization structures, asset structures, exposures, instruments, and the like, as well as by currency. Um, I think that will give us a lot of data that we currently don't have in a systemic way, uh, systematic way. Um, then the BES is enhancing its, its banking statistics, uh, including much more the non-banks, partly because of the shadow banking system. Uh, and lastly, that's going to take a little bit more time. We also have to start covering the pension and insurance industry uh, much better because some of the exposures that were in the banking system have partly migrated. And more generally, we've discovered that these non-banks can also be systemically important. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Our next speaker is David Newman, and he's um, at Wells Fargo Bank. Hello, everyone. Pleased to be here today. Um, and as Nancy mentioned, I'm from uh, Wells Fargo, uh, one of the uh, CIFIs uh, on the charts. And uh, I was very relieved um, by, by looking at uh, one of your key slides, Robert, that Wells Fargo was on the bottom of the list. It was 8 out of 10. So thank you very much. Uh, so what I want to talk about uh, today is, is how data is, is fundamental to solving this puzzle of systemic risk. And uh, I'm also here not only representing Wells Fargo, but also uh, under the auspices of the Enterprise Data Management Council and the Object Management Group, uh, two organizations that have many members across the industry that are collaborating on developing uh, what we're calling a financial industry business ontology, which I'm going to talk about, which is uh, making use of the technology of the 21st century, essentially, to begin to more effectively uh, define data, uh, in addition, of course, to many of the tools uh, that we have uh, in our uh, legacy arsenals. So uh, rather than uh, giving you formulas, which I couldn't do. I'll start with, with a bit of a 
cartoon and, and a data allegory. Uh, but the basic question here uh, that I, I would pose is, is how can we avoid the painful problems of incongruent, opaque, and fragmented financial data? That's, that's somewhat of an existential question. So um, here is um, Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland, and um, hopefully the, the symbolism uh, is, is quite apparent. So I'll read. So when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, nothing more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, is said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. The answer, said Alice, is to semantically define your terms and meanings using an industry standard, ontology as a foundation for data expressivity, precision, consistency, transparency, linkage, and traceability, all the kinds of things that we need. You know, the key thing here, of course, is that there may be many, many Humpty Dumpties across the global system, and how are we going to integrate this? How are we going to put all the pieces together? So I'm going to talk about semantic technology, which we believe is a, uh, a technology that will be gaining tremendous traction uh, in the financial industry as it has begun to gain traction in many other industries from uh, biomedical to pharmaceuticals to telecommunications, uh, very big in the DOD, for example. And, and what it's based on is the concept of knowledge representation being able to effectively define a, a concept. And that's what it's all about in terms of understanding our data. Semantics is based upon what's called description logics, which is an underlying logical formula that uh, ensures that the symbolism used in data is not only understood by a human, but it's understood equally by a machine. So it's all mathematically verifiable. It provides a very strong foundation for data. So what we're looking to do is describe concepts or classes or entities, not legal entities, but entities in a general sense, relationships among these entities, as well as different pieces of individual data. Uh, one of the key differentiators of semantics is that it has intelligence and reasoning capability. So the goal is to be able to transition from perhaps where we are now, uh, from more of a data chaos perspective to a data ordering perspective. And what's uh, important about semantics is that it aligns linguistically with how we think and speak. It's very straightforward and simplistic. There is a subject, a predicate, and an object, in just like we have in basic grammar. But in semantics, this now is all very meaningful to a machine. So as an example, we have an instance of a class called person, our subject, and that person or class has a relationship with a company, which is a class we call an object, and what ties them together, the relationship, is the predicate or a verb, works for. So that's another instance of a class that we can define semantically. So an, in, an example is David is employed by Wells Fargo. David is an instance of a person. <coughs> Wells Fargo is an instance of a company and is employed by is actually a subclass of works for. So we'll understand the interrelationships that is employed by is a subset of works for. So we can see some meaning there. Likewise, if we said Wells Fargo employs David, where employs is another example of a predicate, we could say that is employed by and employees are inversely related. So we can define that relationship semantically. And if we do that, the machine will understand that is employed by and employees are bi in bidirectional. So if we never put into a database that Wells Fargo employs David, but we know ahead of time in our database that David is employed by Wells Fargo, semantic reasoners will then conclude, based on that rule of inverse relationships, that Wells Fargo 
therefore must employ David. So this is a simple example, but it has tremendous implications for how we're able to make better use of data and the relationships of data and the conceptual relationships of data. Now, if you just take this very simple example and you look at our derivatives industry and our mortgage-backed securities and our loans, you're able, we'll be able to define these kinds of relationships for the financial information that's very critical uh, for the functioning of our institutions and for systemic risk analysis, and you can begin to um, imagine having a network graph where these interrelationships of information is all semantically tied together, which will be a way for us to uh, really effectively begin to connect the dots better. So I'm going to contrast semantics to many of our existing legacy um, types of technology. So I hope you can see this um, a little small print on the slide, but I'm going to talk about several conventional legacy uh, ways of today defining data. XML is the, uh, the lingua franca, the main standard of uh, describing data in movement over the wire that's exchanged between uh, different uh, computing systems. So a, uh, an institution that's performing trades will use an example of X, an XML um, written in uh, FPML, which is an ISDA uh, standard uh, that will be sent uh, you know, to the other party or to the uh, swap data repositories. Uh, XML, though, uh, which is going to continue to be a standard, um, is very effective in hierarchically describing the data in a message payload from one group, one system to another, and it's tagged, it's labeled, so you can understand the content. The person, if you looked at that closely, could make sense of it. The difference is, is that a machine cannot make sense of it. What you need is a program that's written by a programmer that takes the knowledge of what's the, what's inside a FPML message, namely a swap information, in order to develop the code on how to interpret the data within an XML message. So we require a lot of programming resources that translates into time and cost. So moving to the, the main standard for data at rest in our databases is a relational database. So in relational database, you have your, your data um, entities or groupings or classes uh, clearly defined as what we call tables. So in this example, we have a swap table which contains swap information, a legal entity table, a swap stream table. So a swap stream has a relationship with a swap by creating another intermediary table that sort of a cross-reference between a, a given swap can have uh, at least one or many swap streams, usually uh, one or two and sometimes three, as, and inversely related to that as well. So what it, you have within a relational is you need to take some of the keys of these tables and join them together. It's very physically oriented. In fact, the schema that defines our relational tables uh, it is you know, somewhat limited in what kind of information it can uh, express more so, beyond having relationships of parents to children. The key thing here is that it also is very labor intensive. It requires programmer resources. Again, knowledge is not in the schema of the table. It's going to be contained and encapsulated in programs that developers have to write. Again, cost, time to market, and if we change our minds, if we want to expand our uh, database schemas, uh, modify them in any way, we have to rebuild the physical databases, we have to reload data, we have to modify our programs. This is all relatively brittle and it incurs cost. So let's now contrast this with semantic technology. Um, so semantics 
is what I would call layering intelligence upon data structures. Again, this is what I would call the technology of the 21st century. Uh, it's relatively new. There is uh, many more uh, innings in the game for semantics. It's still evolving and getting much more expressive and precise. But what is semantics? So um, in this example here, this is, we can look at this as an example of an ontology, which again is a specification of a um, conceptualization. So here we have a class we'll call an interest rate swap contract. We then have a subclass, which is a vanilla interest rate swap contract. So we have a taxonomy built in to the schema automatically. We then could see that a basis swap contract is a subclass of an interest rate swap contract. So we have a taxonomy, we have classification, we have groupings. We know that vanilla interest rate swaps and basis swaps are all kind of interest rate swaps. But so that there's value there, but where there's even greater value is that we can start to define the meaning of things with, by using semantics. So it may be hard to read, but we will be able to define a class that describes what a vanilla interest rate swap contract is, where we could say that a vanilla interest rate swap is where one leg is a variable rate leg and exactly one leg is a fixed rate leg. That's the definition of a vanilla interest rate swap. This can be defined semantically as a basis swap might be where one leg is variable and the other leg is variable. So semantics is able to capture the meaning which allows a machine to look at the structure of the data where we may have other rules that would suggest that one leg that has an index is therefore a variable rate leg and another leg that has a fixed interest, a fixed rate is therefore a fixed rate leg, semantically we can then re reason and conclude that this must be a vanilla interest rate swap. So the machine can understand the relationships of the data within the structure without requiring programmers to write code. Not that there wouldn't be programs, yes there would be, but more of the intelligence is then moved out of the program into the schema. Why is this important? Because this then can become a standard. Uh, in addition, semantics allows different data that's named differently but means the same to be tied together. So it positions us to be able to understand data that's represented differently in different databases and different systems but has the same semantic conceptual meaning can be tied together. And the opposite case, where data may be named the same, because that could happen, but is semantically different, will, will, uh, the machine will automatically know that this is disparate data and not to be joined. So it's, it's a very powerful capability, um, and this is something we can effectively leverage. Uh, one other thing I want to mention is, is that semantics is a lot more forgiving than conventional technologies if we change our mind. And it's important that we're allowed to change our assumptions because our, the world changes, models change, we want to change our assumptions, we want those assumptions to be reflected in how we categorize our data. With semantics, we can change the schema, the concepts, without forcing ourselves to physically change the database, which is what we do with our more conventional technologies. Therefore, it's much more agile, supple, flexible, and ultimately it results in lower total cost of ownership, as well as faster latency, faster time to market. So uh, this is the last slide that I want to start to paint a picture of building blocks so that we want to start to think about how we can begin to leverage this technology going forward to be able to use it more effectively for the future. So we want to build a foundation. So what we're doing with this collaborative effort to build out this 
financial industry business ontology uh, is to start to define aspects of uh, key um, uh, domains within the financial industry, which would include uh, derivatives, securities, mortgages, uh, et cetera. Uh, we participated in building a proof of concept for derivatives, for OTC derivatives, specifically vanilla interest rate swaps, uh, that proved its point. This allows the data to be interlinked, interconnected, holistically linked, where we can traverse data across many different domains. Once we can define the semantics of the data, we can tie it together. So this is what is uh, planned for FIBO, uh, for short, uh, which will be, uh, we hope, a uh, industry standard uh, in order to provide greater expressivity. Now, this is, FIBO is a conceptual ontology. It's also highly descriptive, and it's human-facing. So, as I mentioned earlier, ontologies are not only facing or, or friendly to people, where we can tie this information together visually, it's also friendly to machines. So the same uh, ontologies that drive the uh, explanations of, inf of, of information for humans could, cr could create um, ontologies that can be used simply for machines as well from an operational point of view. So we have a benefit of greater descriptiveness. We now have some uh, operational benefits where we can represent knowledge and data semantically in our systems, in our runtime systems. We can see the structure of data, so we can see our taxonomies. Once we can semantically define data, we can uh, realize better and uh, improve traceability and data consistency, which is critical. So in a runtime environment, we could query these ontologies to understand the structure of our data, the lineage of our data, the provenance of our data, so we can have greater trust. In other words, we can see where its origins are. There's a huge amount of richness associated with the data. The next phase up the stack is where we can start to use uh, the reasoning capability of semantics, where we can begin to infer uh, groupings and classifications of our data without being rigid about taxonomies, without being uh, necessarily, um, you know, con where our investment is constrained and fixed, we can allow for much greater flexibility and change through uh, classifying and categorizing the data uh, in many uh, ways that fulfill our requirements. And this is something that we see can be very effective in performing asset and risk categorizations and classifications. And then moving up the stack, we can improve our query capabilities. Semantics offers a very rich means of data federation. So we know that in the world out there, there are many data silos. Semantics can provide a way to integrate, even if the end data is uh, siloed, disparate, incongruent, by defining an ontology as an intermediary layer, we can still perform integrated queries against highly disparate data, uh, which is very important for uh, rolling up data, aggregating data that we need for our systemic risk analytics, and ultimately for transparency. So uh, I hope I, I was able to give you somewhat of a uh, feel for, this is a very highly uh, technical subject as well, um, and I hope I gave you a feel for some of the benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So our next speaker is uh, Jay Runkel, who is going to, is here from Mark Logic. So my name is Jay, sorry, I'm fighting a cold here. My name is Jay Runkel. I am a solution consult with Mark Logic, and I spend about two to three days a week walking up and down the sidewalks of Manhattan, meeting with various financial services organizations. And what I put together today is kind of an overview on how these organizations are trying to aggregate 
create an aggregate picture of the risk that they have across their enterprise and some of the challenges they face in doing that and some of their current approaches to solve that problem. This kind of ties directly into some of Peter's comments earlier on. So I'm going to start out and give you one slide on Mark Logic. I think that'll help provide the background for this, and then I'm going to jump right into the topic. So Mark Logic is a company that provides um, a platform that enables companies to essentially analyze big data, so large volumes of data, typically very disparate data, you know, text, numerical data, emails, documents, what have you. Um, and essentially what our customers do is they build applications that enable them to make decisions over that data. So in, for the federal government, that may be an intelligence agency that's looking at, you know, various intelligence data and trying to, you know, look for terrorist activity or protect, um, you know, U.S. citizens or assets. Or it may be an airline that is looking at flight operations manuals for a large aircraft and enabling a flight crew member to, in kind of a half a second, find the one paragraph or sentence they need on how to operate that particular aircraft in the middle of a crisis. Or it might be a media company that um, is trying to deliver very targeted, personalized information to their customers. So we have over 500 production implementations, and they range from you know, government customers to financial services organizations to media customers, things like that. And we're a global company with um, offices around the world. So if you look at Mark Logic in financial services, we typically do two types of solutions. In the front office, it's really about decision support, essentially giving traders the ability to pull together lots of different information from lots of different sources, understand that information so that they can make better decisions. The idea is that if you understand the world better than the person you're trading with, you're going to have an advantage. Um, and in the back office, it's about enabling them to pull together lots of internal data from the various systems that they have so that they can understand risk, but we're real, we're really focusing in real time. We want to understand our risk across all of our positions in the bank right now, not at what they were last week or last month. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to drill in on this second topic. So I want to give you an idea of why this problem is so hard. So if you look at a particularly, you know, a multinational financial services organization, they have lots of different trading systems. They might have one for equities and for fixed income and for um, FX and derivatives, and it just goes on and on and on because they have lots of different financial products. So that's one challenge, so lots of different systems. The other problem is that these systems tend to be replicated around the world. So we might have a set of systems in New York. We might have some in London. We might have some in Hong Kong. And you know, these, the reason why these different systems exist, some of it's because of acquisition, some of it's because different days of the week of trading or different time periods of trading. So there's lots of different what reasons why these systems exist, but they're there, and they're critical to the operation of the bank. So um, it's not something where you can easily go and change. Is. The other thing is that there's extremely high data volumes. Um, I, in one, one particular customer we're talking to, you know, they expected peak volumes across all of their systems to be about a million transactions a second. So these have to be you know, extremely high volumes. There's lot, because there's so much different financial products and the attributes used to, that you care about for each financial products are different, there's lots of different data, lots of different types you need to pull together in one system. And that tends to be really hard. The other thing is that it's constantly evolving. So there's new products coming out all the time. The systems I have grown up here are constantly evolving. There's new things we want to keep track about them all the time. So this, even if you solve the problem for right now, you're going to need to fix, solve it again tomorrow and the day after. So you need to have a very flexible environment. So how do they solve this problem today? So the, the typical approach is to create what they call, oh, um, uh, here's a new acronym, acronym for today. ODS stands for Operational Data Store. I couldn't actually fit it in the bullet there. So Operational Data Store. It's essentially a intermediate repository where we're going to aggregate some of the information. Now, it, they typically can't aggregate all of it, so we might aggregate all of our equity information to an operational data store or all our derivatives like operational data store. Maybe we ag aggregate by region or something like that. So we have a whole host of smaller operational data stores which then feed into a data warehouse where the actual risk assessment is done. The problem with this whole approach is, first thing is this gives you answers in hours or days, not in seconds when you really want it. You typically want to know my risk as it is right now, not as it was, as it was yesterday or the day before or last week. The other thing is if you have a new type of risk analysis you want to do, it typically requires a significant amount of engineering in the order of weeks or months. It's not something where we can go, somebody in a risk department or in the business can dream up of a new type of analysis they want to do and they can get that answer tomorrow. It takes really long time, so that's definitely an impediment. 
So that kind of gives you a background of why things are so hard. And let me give you an idea of how some of the ways people are trying to address this problem today. So what they've, people have um, determined is that the best way to solve this problem is to do the analysis in these operational data stores. This whole enterprise transfer and load process of getting data to a data warehouse takes too long. We have a lot of the data um, right here, so let's just do the analysis in these enterprise data stores. Let's not do it in the data warehouse. The problem is, is that means that our, that, that operational data store layer has to look a lot different. We need a whole different set of technologies. Um, so typically what we want is fewer or maybe one operational data store. And we want to put, we need to essentially have a platform that has a set of features that are vastly different than kind of the traditional relational databases used today. They need to be much more scalable and performant. They need to handle, be able to handle lots of different types of data. And when I come up with a new data type, I need you to be able to just put it in without having to do a lot of engineering. And once I have all this different data in there, I need to be able to generate all these queries um, ad hoc and um, get my answers in real time without having to do a lot of, you know, getting a whole bunch of ITP people involved to do a lot of engineering. And this needs to be an enterprise class application, provides all the high availability and disaster recovery and all that type of stuff that you would expect. So there's examples of solutions of what was different categories of solutions that, that financial institutions are using to address this problem. One obviously is Mark, Mark Logic. There's a whole category of kind of NoSQL repositories that people look at. But essentially what that means is you end up with an architecture like this. You end up, you have, a op, you have one or a few operational data stores and you have, you do your real time analytics for risk against that new operational data store. You don't get rid of the data warehouse. It's typically now used for more long, longer term historical analysis. But I now can essentially go queries against that in real time against the operational data store. It's also important to tie this into um, David Newman's talk. Many of organizations that are choosing to go with multiple operational data stores are considering using semantic technologies as a way to tie them all together and kind of do aggregate queries across them. So just a quick summary of where organizations are today. Most tier one financial services institutions have a project underway to uh, um, do some sort of enterprise risk aggregation. And there, I see typically two pr approaches. One approach is let's build this, um, repository, this, this operational data store. Let's get all of our data in one place. Let's not worry too much about the capabilities of that store. Let's get some basic bare bones analysis capabilities and over time, we're going to make this thing more and more capable so we can do more and more types of analysis. The second approach, um, which other organizations have taken, is let's pick our most um, critical product, the one where we have the most problem understanding risk. Typically, it's some sort of derivatives product. And um, let's build a powerful risk analysis platform. Let's aggregate all of our derivatives information across the bank into one place and then expand that platform to handle other products over time, like FX or fixed income or things like that. So it's typically what I see, most banking organizations are somewhere in the middle of either approach one or approach two right now. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to open the um, panel up for questions. So Pete, you're on. Okay, I, I use this panel discussion as, as, a, uh, as, as if it were a debate okay. um, over people favoring different types of ways of, of doing data. So um, Pete Axelrod is saying, I think you need a relational database that's reasonably straightforward, that has a centralized set of definitions that DTCC has set up, and then it can do queries on that data for you based on your access uh, uh, backed up by confidentiality agreements and so forth, and it can be sent out to different countries or even potentially sent to the IMF. Seems like a very simple uh, solution to the problem, it, but it has uh, potential inflexibility in that DTCC has defined it, and uh, you're, you're stuck with what DTCC offers. It's also that there's a possibility of other competing uh, entities that, that might offer similar things. So then David comes along and says, we need a semantic repository, which is kind of like saying, let's don't have a DTCC. Let's let, let's let Greece define what a mortgage is, and let's let Greece define what default on a mortgage is, and let's impose a semantic structure on top of that 
that would allow default in Greece to be comparable to default in the U.S. or would allow the long position of a derivatives con uh, contract to, where one leg is in Greece to be matched with the short position in the U.S. where one leg is in the U.S. I think there's a zero probability that all the trades would ever match. And given that you've allowed Greece to change the definitions every week, no one will understand really what they're getting from Greece or what it means as a practical matter. Um, so then Jay comes along and says, well, suppose that Greece hasn't even gotten to the point of imposing uh, a, a, a semantic structure on its data. You hire a consulting firm, and they impose their semantic structure on it for you. The consulting <laughs> firm's first incentive is to make sure that that system stays as complicated and labor-intensive as possible so the consulting firm's business model doesn't evaporate like it would if DTCC came along. And that leads to even worse outcome. So am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to do it sequentially, answering those questions? I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. First of all, I personally don't know from relational databases, from semantics or anything like that. I, I know enough to say the words, and, uh, but I do, I, I guess I'm glad that a lot of the complexity of gathering the internal complexity that the large sort of multi-jurisdictional financial firms have in internally gathering data and get, getting them into a reportable form and uh, is, was brought out because I think, I think those institutions are only going to do this once and to, to expect them to do it multiple times or to change every other year how it's being done I think is not realistic. They've, you know, it's it's one of the things. It adds no value. I'm gonna don't. I, I know I'm overstating it, but it these sorts of reporting. Other, I mean, there are ancillary risk management benefits, but the reporting itself really adds no value to their businesses. It is a regulatory requirement. They would like to dump it off on somebody else if they could. Um, they want to be out of the loop as much as possible, but they know they're going to be held responsible for it. So I, I, I guess I think it's a big, huge industry spend, and once it happens, I doubt it's going to be revisited. So, well, well I, I think what I was trying to say in my presentation, think about what the, what's the purpose you're trying to collect data for, and that can vary quite a bit across different phases of the crisis. Uh, second, look a lot what's out there already. I mean, I think there's quite a bit out there already that can be used uh, more smarter. Um, uh, and in order to go global, which I think we have to, it has to be very simple. Maybe it's, it's partly um, simple-minded, but uh, uh, there's a lot of data that we've used on exposures that have been turned out to be very useful, which are very basic data. Uh, and, uh, and going back to my other theme, uh, look, let's look at the banking system, because that's where a lot of the stuff, the real bad stuff happens in the end. Uh, and if we were to get agreement on that at the international level, I think we made some progress. Beyond that, I think it's going to take a long time, because there are hurdles that are beyond all of the data management and, and what have you. The confidentiality, privacy, political constraints are quite, quite large. Uh, so uh, let's, let's try to m move in pieces, and then let's try to prioritize and like I said, banking, exposure, those type of data would be the most useful to get going on first. So with uh, semantics, our, our uh, hope is that uh, you know, we can uh, get uh, some form of, is this off? It's, it's working. It's OK. Uh, of um, uh, standardization uh, process uh, completed, uh, but it's an evolutionary process. It's a journey. Uh, we've started now to uh, work with uh, uh, the uh, ISO uh, International Standards Organization, ISO 20022. Uh, so this is a, a broad collaborative effort. Uh, the, the intent, so to your, your question, uh, you know, what happens if uh, we have this layer and Greece changes their uh, uh, perspectives on, on uh, trades and, you know, will that, that throw us off, essentially. Uh, you know, and I, I don't really see that that kind of um, uh, volatility happening in terms of changing assumptions that quickly. Uh, and what we're, our intent is, is to start to uh, uh, capture and describe, you know, the raw data uh, and get some concurrence there on, you know, essentially what is a 
what is the definition of a swap and a leg to a swap uh, that forms a, uh, an interest rate swap or a credit default swap? How is that different? At the very higher levels of abstraction, sure, those could change, and that's where we expect change to occur at each, uh, each different uh, recipient or user can change their semantics, their uh, top-level assumptions, uh, but it doesn't force a, a, a change in the entire infrastructure or at the lowest atomic levels. My one thought when listening to your question was, is I really think the three approaches are evolutionary. I think as a first step, you might create a simple repository that has some just basic information, a few attributes about, about all the different um, investment products, but you have, a, you have all that information in a central repository in a standard way. And then you begin to move into some of the things where I was talking about where you can essentially put in all of your information about all of your investment products and then query against it. That's kind of like the next evolution. And then to me, the final evolution is if you now have a semantic model of that information, not only can your internal organization understand what's in there, but you now have a infrastructure that enables other organizations to be able to interact with that repository and query it, since it's, it's, it's precisely defined. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm going to return a favor that we would do. Oh, sorry. Uh, Alan King, IBM. I'm going to return a favor that Pete did for me a, a little while ago. Um, I'm going to stand up and defend one of the speakers against a criticism. Um, I, I actually think that. Um, from my perspective, the customers we see that Jay, Jay's talk was pretty much right on, that um, people are moving to these operational data stores with very little structure in the data store. Um, and the question really, I have a question, by the way, but I think that it kind of circles back to a comment that um, Stein Klassen's made, which is that it has a lot to do with what you're trying to do. And um, there is a very, very big difference between, say, uh, transactional data stores in which, you know, reconciliation and auditability are important and um, the requirements of, say, an IMF who simply wants to get, you know, a ballpark measure of an exposure which, you know, if it's off by 5% or 10%, you know, during the day, nobody's going to really care about it that much because you're just trying to get order of magnitude influences. And I think there's a tendency in the IT world to try to be too precise about things. Now, the um, so when we see these operational data stores, and now this is turning into a question for Jay, kind of coming from the semantic world context, which is, I'm just wondering in a in a stream in which a million transactions are flowing through per second, what on earth could be ad hoc query in that environment? Wouldn't you really need to have some kind of semantic structure already embedded in the ODSs, say in FPGA filters or something like that, to actually pull out information that you know you're gonna need to query against, and it's not gonna be completely ad hoc like you know, uh, what are all the what are all the instruments with names who have blue in their logos? I mean, you know, you're not going to ask questions like that. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that there's no no data model, there's no structure. Typically, what we're doing the, what we're doing though is relaxing the amount of structure that's required, yeah. right? So, you know, you, you, everything obviously is going to have to have so there's going to have to be some standards about you know having IDs and all those types of things and naming conventions and. You have to know if it's a derivative, what particular parameters are about it. The idea, though, is that if somebody throws in a new, new type, if somebody dreams up a new financial product, we can just throw it in, define what it is, and begin to work with it right away, as opposed to six, work, doing six months worth of work. Thank you. Um, Rick Ross. Um, so I guess Adam's point was indices are a good idea when you have data, certainly. Um, but I have a question for Jay. Last time I looked, Mark Logic was a really cool um, X-Query engine under the covers. Is that still true? Um, and if so, yeah. isn't XQuery like the worst possible choice for real time? Um, and that's one. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, two, um, independent of the performance issues, how would you help David in his charter 
uh, for Semantic Web, as well as the other participants to your right, helping them do what they need to do Absolutely. using XQuery and XML. Okay. So, so yes, MarkLogic is a XML database or an XML repository. That's absolutely. But one of our place in the market is performance and scale. So we, yeah, yeah, XQuery is the primary interface language. Um, yes, it is. But we have spent significant engineering hours um, making sure that it's fast. I mean, we have customers that have hundreds of terabytes of content billions of XML documents in MarkLogic and able to query those repositories and get answers back in under a second. So it is very fast. So when I meant real time here, I was talking kind of second response time, not, you know, every, real time means something different to everybody. So we're talking getting an answer back in a second, basically, by our def my definition of real time. Um, in terms of semantic technologies and how MarkLogic um, works very well with semantic technologies, and in fact, um, many organizations you find MarkLogic to be an ideal store for the semantic data that they then query. So I think it fits nicely with David's talk. In fact, we, over lunch, we were talking about potentially in some of the work he's doing, using MarkLogic as the platform for his semantic work. There's a question back. No, wait. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Mick Silver to following up. I am, I'm an IMF following up presentation. Uh, this, I mean, there's this obvious need for U.S. agencies to, to look for their own needs, especially very quickly. And there's also an obvious need for institutions such as ourselves, has been pointed out, uh, for surveillance, for research, to also put together a global database. But there was an important uh, slide which went on up, which Tyne put on up, about an FSB IMF initiative uh, that the G20 is putting forward. And this defines some of the standards, or is trying to define, that we can implement globally on these measures. It takes time, of course, and there's, a, there's more immediate needs, as most of us are aware, in, rather than putting these international standards together to get for countries to get their own house in order. But this is a major initiative of harmonizing definitions, data sources, which the ECB, Eurostat, uh, BIS, IMF, and FCC. FSB and major statistical authorities and central banks around in G20 are putting it together. So there's this long run vision, which was in the slides Stein naturally had, which I, I thought just to draw more attention to coming out of the whole thing. But it's, it's a long run vision. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bill Siegel, uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency, and uh, you know, like some of us here, I'm I'm an economist, but I, I'm trying to, you know, educate myself a little bit about technology, and and this is a fascinating uh, presentation in in that regard. Uh, so one of the things that I'm that I'm worried about here is all that a time that I've spent trying to understand uh, relational databases is is. Uh, it's sort of like the horse and buggy thing. Uh, just, just, I, I just want to hear it straight. It, are relational databases obsolete within the, the context of financial services, or, or are they still going to have a niche? And, and, uh, and, and what's replacing them? What do I need to learn? So, so is that for Jay? Or? I, don't, I mean, I'll take it, or you can take it to you. David, why don't you take yeah, it? I'll, yeah, so let me take it, and you can jump in. So basically, <laughs> Um, so there will always be, I think for the foreseeable future, there will definitely be a place for relational databases. They're not going away. I think it's the types of, pro I mean, it's typically it's using the right tool for the right job. So um, nobody's going to replace their general ledger system with a system like MarkLogic. You know, basically, if you have rows and columns of numbers or, or small text fields, that's perfect for a relational database. If you're dealing with what we like to call it unstructured information, and that can be text, but that also can be numerical data where the structure is constantly varying. It's very different, and that tends to be stuff that's very hard to shove into rows and columns. So if you're in that type of environment, then an application like MarkLogic is a good fit. Pretty much uh, ditto to what Jay said. Uh, we've made huge, huge investments in relational technology. And my talk on semantics, uh, I didn't mean to imply that we would uh, replace relational and everyone has to worry about making uh, huge new capital investments in IT infrastructure. Uh, not at all. Uh, semantics is going to be a very uh, incremental, iterative, uh, evolutionary process 
where, based on the use case, we'll utilize semantics typically in uh, tandem and conjunction with um, our conventional technologies, our XML uh, messaging and our relational database technology. So it's going to depend on the use case. So where we see semantics on day one is first uh, using it for better uh, expressiveness and descriptive capabilities. Yes, operationally we see some huge lift and upside there, uh, but as I said, I think it's going to work in tandem uh, and in um, uh, interoperation with, uh, with relational databases. Yeah. I, I just, I, it, danger of talking about something I know absolutely nothing about, I would just point out that in general, unless technology is truly disruptive and it truly just causes everybody to throw out what they've been doing and do something else, the closer you get to the center of an infrastructure, the older the technology is going to be because the replacement process takes years and the whole industry has to change. So just as an example, and my guess is half the people in the room would be horrified at this, DTC, the Depository Trust Companies, the Central Securities Depository for the U.S., runs on compiler today. Our other core systems are COBOL. Um, they work. They've worked for 30 years. Yes, it's we pay IBM a hefty fee to, to run the main room. So, the, uh, but it's you know I think we have to change. I think we are. We did change out of compiler because you know basically the only people who can do it are retired or retirement age, and so you do have to change. But it, it change goes very very slowly when you have to get an entire industry to change the way they operate. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a New York Fed. Uh, one question I want to ask the panel in general is the uh, the issue of aggregation in data collection. I think CDS repository, repository is special because you basically collect uh, transa transactional level data. Then you can, of course, in aggregate the slice dice in different ways, but. Maybe that's possible for other ODC derivatives, but uh, it is very difficult to many other market uh, information because the volume of the data is just too big to collect the lowest level of details. So as a bank supervisor, typically we request from the banks will be say what do you want to look at, then that will determine what's the way to aggregate, then the bank will collect information, will look at information, then it will depend, what we see depends on what we understand. For example, in the area of systemic risk, it's a new expanding area, so all these new development uh, academic research may open up new um, understanding areas that will go back to bank to ask, say, we want to look at data in different ways, so they will have to go back to extract from their production data. So what is the you know, general direction or strategy um, to deal with this uh, um, aggregation? Mm -hmm. Great. Who would like to take it? Steve? David? So, uh, so I'll take a crack at that. So, so where you know the the value proposition of of semantics is is that it, it allows us to effectively uh, trace uh, the lineage of the data that we're aggregating back to its source because we have conformity to a common semantic standard, and that the way we slice and dice through aggregation and roll up can be done you know, very dynamically um, uh, through the use of uh, applying reasoners uh, based on rules uh, that can be done through the ontology uh, without requiring a lot of complex programming and that it's all uh, homogeneous and consistent throughout that ontology, we, we have a, a greater sense of uh, certainty about uh, the fidelity of the data that we're rolling all the way up to the top. Yeah, I think when you talk about systemic risk, I think it's very difficult because I, we basically still don't know what causes crisis uh, and uh, for what 
consequently what kind of data we should be collecting. Of course, we have made some advance in terms of conceptual models, uh, I sketched out some of those, but I think they're still at the level of abstraction that we don't really can go down and say, now this is the data that we really need because that will answer. Uh, and things also change uh, from time to time. So I think the industry will have to be flexible in that respect in terms of satisfying the interest of the regulatory authority uh, who is, should be looking after the systemic risk. Consistency, obviously, is something that we should all strive for because that will, at least on the basic data, help us. Uh, uh, but beyond that, I think it's going to be an ad hoc kind of a situation where we have to uh, allow institutions like the OFR and the European Stability Board and others really to be very uh, flexible in terms of their ad hoc request while we're in the middle of a crisis. In steady state, we may be, be able to, to settle down a little bit more and come up with some templates that can satisfy uh, the needs uh, going forward. Uh, Go ahead, oh, I, I'm sorry, I just was going to urge the uh, supervisory and regulatory community to get out ahead of this as much as they can. Um, financial services firms will do what you tell them to do. Um, the, there was a lot of work that regulators had done prior to Dodd-Frank with respect to trade reporting, and that's going to make Dodd-Frank compliance easier. Uh, regulators had begun insisting on granular data before Dodd-Frank required it. I think, as you'll hear tomorrow, if, if, you know, if more and better mortgage data is needed, for instance, if you start working on it now, you'll probably get reporting uh, over time of the type of mortgage data you need with the degree of, with probably a, a very high degree of granularity because you're, that granularity will solve other problems. So I, I think if you get out ahead of it, you'll, you'll get what you need. So why don't we take the rest of questions offline, if you could all join me in thanking this panel for a really interesting discussion.